Michael Kasky Blomay, 97.3 ESPN.com. The Real Mike KB on Twitter joins us now here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Get you ready for tomorrow night's Eagles, uh, excuse me, Sixers-Celtics matchup as uh, they come out of the gate firing a rematch of the playoffs last year. And, Michael, it looks like Markel Fultz is going to be in the starting lineup. Uh, do you like this move by Brett Brown? He's going to go with Fultz as the starter, but he kind of indicated that J.J. Redick might be the guy to kind of start the second half and maybe even close games out. So give us your thoughts on that situation with Markel and J.J. in the starting rotation. Yeah, Mike, that's uh, you know, going to be really interesting. It's something, obviously, that he uh, you know experimented with during the preseason, starting Markel in that, that two-guard spot and having J.J. come off the bench. Uh, you know, I wasn't sure at the time if that was going to be a, a permanent thing, but obviously he made it official today that, uh, yeah, he's going to go with Markel to, you know, like you said, to at least start the games. I think it, it's a move with the long term, um, you know, of the franchise in mind. I think in, in the short term, uh, you know, the team might suffer a little bit. We're talking, you know, they had statistically the best uh, starting five in the NBA last season. J.J. knew his role really well. He, he was a perfect complement to Ben and Joel in that starting group. So I think in the short term, especially against a team like Boston that's very well coached by Brad Stevens and could kind of, you know, execute to kind of, uh, you know, isolate Markel, I think it'll be a move that could, you could see a little some struggles, but in the long term, I think it's a thing that Brett really wants to get, you know, get Markel's confidence up, get him feeling comfortable playing with that role. Because ultimately, you know, he was selected with that top pick last year to be, uh, you know, to be a starting caliber player and to be the, uh, you know, the third piece of that trio with Ben and Joel. And I think it's, uh, you know, to start the season, Brett just really wants to see, you know, what, what he has in Markel. Um, yeah, because obviously um, they – I want to ask you, if you watch the preseason four games, did you feel comfortable – did you like enough with, with what you saw that Markel won that position? Because obviously they're looking – I, I would assume to get a little bit more punch off the bench with JJ, and that they're hoping that Fultz kind of meshes well and gives them that slashing player that they were lacking last year. But did you see enough in the preseason to say this guy won that position? Uh, no, honestly, I personally didn't see enough in the preseason to say that, Mike. Again, that's not you know that's not necessarily a mark on Markel. I, I do think he has the skill to potentially do it. Uh, I, I didn't think he played exceptionally well in China. I think there was still some hesitation. Um, you know, taking the shot there. I think there was still some times where he looked a little bit lost on offense. I think, you know, if if we're talking straight up, like who's going to give you the better chance to win a game right now, I think J.J. in that starting spot would be better. Um, but this is the thing with Markel that I think Brett knows it's going to take, you know, some time for him to really get his feet wet and get comfortable in that role. It's not something that was just going to happen, you know, over the course of two games in China and two games here in the preseason. I think it's something that's going to take, you know, a month, a couple months for him to get comfortable. And the goal ultimately, you know, as Brett talked about today in his media session, is, you know, he wants this team to be competing in, in deep into May and into June. And he's hoping that, you know, by putting Markel in this position now and letting him take these lumps in October and November, that hopefully come, you know, 2019, March, April, that he'll be, you know, comfortable and the rotation will be fluid. Uh, Michael Kasky, Blomay, 97.3 ESPN.com. All right. Um, Joel Embiid, his development. You know, somebody asked me today, what would you say are the five big things to watch for storylines going into tomorrow? I said Fultz obviously is one. Number two for me is Embiid's development. How? I mean, realistically, okay, they went out and tried to got a big-time star. They didn't get one, which means Fultz obviously has to be a big-time player. But the development from year to year for Embiid, is that not next on the list? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. I think it is. If Fultz is number one, then Joel's development has to be 1A. Um, you know, you and I and everyone else has talked about how this is the first time that Joel actually had an, you know, an entire healthy offseason to himself to work and improve upon his game. He wasn't rehabbing from anything. He wasn't limited. He was, you know, he was a full go this summer. And I think he knew, you know, what that meant for him. And I think he knows that he could take that next step from, you know, an all-star starter, which he was last year, to, uh, you know, an MVP caliber player perennially. And ultimately, you know, the Sixers' success this year and in the long term, regardless of, you know, who they were able to add or weren't add or who they will add, they're going to go as far as Ben and Joel and hopefully Markel take them. So I think this year is really the year that we'll see, 
you know, not necessarily the full potential of Joel because he can still get better, but we'll finally see that, you know, the Joel that's, you know, healthy, ready to go and just ready to take the league by storm. I think he'll be up there in the, uh, you know, the MVP conversation for sure. And then to me, uh, number three, Dario. I mean, he seems like the forgotten guy always, but how far along has he come? Because I thought last year he made strides as a guy who was kind of a grinder, sliding on the floor, get dirty. He expanded his game to shoot the three more. But I want to see how much more he's evolved now in year number three, how much deeper, uh, how much more range he has, what kind of player he is now in year three. Yeah, well, you said it perfectly, Mike, when you said that he's kind of the forgotten guy. I mean, this is a guy, I think if he was on another franchise that had more veterans, he would be garnering, you know, a lot more attention and hype around the league. I think it's just the fact that he's, you know, the Sixers have so much intriguing young talent, Ben, Joel, the whole story with Martell, that Dario ends up getting bumped down to fourth, you know, really the fourth guy we kind of talk about. But he's a guy that, like you said, showed, you know, huge development last year. And I think he he was on trajectory to continue to do that going into this year. Last year, he you know, was the first year he was really asked to play a lot without the ball in his hands. He kind of learned how to be a spot-up guy off of Joel in that power forward spot. And he does, like you said, so much of that hard nose, uh, you know, just like tough stuff, fighting for rebounds, getting on the ground, like hustling, that he, uh, you know, was really, really ingrained his value into that team. So I think, you know, he's a guy that's, like you said, kind of forgotten, but his contributions will be huge to this team this year. I think, uh, you know, he played over the summer a lot with his, uh, you know, the national team. He kept playing. He said that he worked on his shot still. That was a... you know, he got better last year, but it was a work in progress. I think this year we'll see a, a version of Dario that's just not afraid to, you know, take the shot when it's there and knock down shots and continue to, you know, develop off of Ben and Joel. Uh, my next one uh, for me, I'm looking at this, you know, depth. Are they deeper? Are they more athletic than the team last year? Because for me, they went out and tried to get the big player. They didn't get them. They didn't panic. They went out and at it to an area that they lacked last year, perimeter defense, athleticism on the perimeter. When they played uh, Boston, they didn't have the wing defenders to to match up with that team. That, to me, is a big story. Are they deeper? Are they more athletic? Uh, You know, that that is a a huge story, Mike, going in. Obviously, tomorrow night, I don't think you'll see – they won't be, obviously. You know, Wilson Chandler is not going to be ready to go tomorrow night. Uh, Mike Mascal is questionable. So, I mean, some of that depth in the opening night, uh, it looks like it's going to take a hit. But in general, I do think that they address some of the versatility issues. Um, you know, Markel seems to be a pretty willing and able defender for, uh, you know, the one through three spot. And obviously, Wilson Chandler's addition, um, you know, he'll be a, a big help in that perimeter kind of switchable role where you can play one through three. Uh, you know, but that's certainly something that's going to be an issue coming into the season. I think a big, you know, a big thing that a lot of people will be looking for in the short term, unfortunately, until Wilson Chandler gets back out, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, probably an issue for the team. Yeah, uh, Chandler's interesting because we didn't get to see him at all in the preseason. So um, is he six man? I guess with Redick, he's probably maybe the seventh man. But do you think that Chandler is a, has a big role on this team? Yeah, I do. It's unfortunate that, you know, we barely got to see him in preseason. Like you said, that was a guy I had mentioned, uh, you know, obviously other than Markel, I was really kind of excited to see how Wilson, you know, kind of how he fit into the, the role and the rotation of the team and how he kind of played off of those other players. We obviously didn't get to see that, but, you know, from what I've seen in, in training camps thus far and in practice, and from what Brett said, I has said, I do think that, uh, you know, Wilson's going to see a big, you know, a big role off of the bench for this team this year in terms of a guy that kind of brings that toughness, uh, ability to knock down shots, uh, versatility on defense, switchability between, you know, the one, two, and three. Um, you know, with the switch to Markel starting, J.J. will, in you know, most situations, I think probably be the first guy off the bench. But we're looking at a guy in Wilson who will be, you know, could potentially come in for Robert. He could potentially come in for Dario. You know, could play some shooting guard in, in a pinch. So I think we'll see him get you know, anywhere from 25 to, you know, 33 minutes a game probably and play in, a, you know, a legitimate probably seventh man role for this for the team. Yeah, I know Brown said today that uh, T.J. McConnell is going to pick up the Muscala minutes, which is interesting because they obviously don't play the same position, uh, which I guess goes to the positionless basketball. But what is McConnell's role on this team um, with Fultz here? 
I, I think his role is really just to be ready to contribute and bring, you know, what he brings to the floor when he's needed. Having, you know, it's not too often you hear a team that plans to start a player, you know, to, to start games and then potentially bring another player in to start the second half, like Brett has mentioned doing with Markel and J.J., and in that situation, he's talked about using Markel as the primary point guard in the second half, you know, bringing him in for Ben. And at that point, you know, it would basically eat all of TJ's minutes. I think TJ is a guy that might not have necessarily a very clear-cut role, especially to start the season as Brett's kind of feeling all this out and, you know, trying out Markel in the starting lineup and bringing JJ off the bench. I don't think TJ is going to have a, you know, a night-in, night-out role where he can be like, all right, I'm going to go in at this point and play these many minutes, which is going to be tough for him. But I think he's going to be – you know, one of those guys that's expected to, you know, kind of just be ready whenever his number is called, as, you know, as the cliche goes, and just bring in that same intensity. It could be, you know, a game where they're playing poorly and Brett thinks they need a spark and he puts them in in the first quarter, and there could be games where, you know, he might not see the court till garbage time. So it's definitely going to be tough for TJ, but I think uh, I think he kind of knows what, what's ahead of him, and he'll just, you know, he always brings that intensity, and I think that's what he'll be looked to do. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they fit him into the mix. There's a lot of interesting storylines in here, and uh, one of them is uh, I think when you look at Landry Shamit, who's a guy that if you were to say, did Fultz earn his position, you would say earlier, you're not real sure. Did Shamit earn a place in the rotation? I think so, Mike, at least to the point that he's in the consciousness of Brett Brown. I don't think he necessarily, like, bumped anyone or, you know, leapfrogged anyone, but he was a guy that on draft day in the, in the summer league, you know, I didn't necessarily think we'd be seeing a lot of time. But with the way that obviously the team is constructed, some of the injuries they have with Zaire out, you know, questions about Markel, Landry brings something, you know, that you can count on and that you need in terms of floor spacing and knocking down shots. You know, he displayed that during the preseason in the, that game in China. He was shooting the lights out. So I think there will be an opportunity for him. It'll be maybe similar along the lines of TJ where it's not going to be a night in, night out consistent role. But with what he showed in the preseason, I do think that he kind of cemented himself at least somewhere in the rotation of, you know, this guy's going to get minutes at one point or another when they need someone to, you know, come in and space the floor. Yeah, I was impressed with his catch and shoot. I was impressed with his uh, the speed of his release. I mean, I think he might be a guy uh, who ends up surprising people. And I know they like, I mean, uh, you talk to people around the Sixers, they they like him and they, and they think that uh, they, they might have found a diamond in the rough. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. It's a guy that, I, you know, I didn't know too much about when they drafted him coming out of college outside of the fact that he could shoot. But everyone in the organization, you know, they, they talk about how hardworking he is, how eager he is to, you know, kind of just learn, uh, you know, he talks, he's been shooting around with JJ a lot, obviously, which is a, uh, you know, a positive for a young player. So I definitely think he, he's caught me by surprise, certainly in preseason play to the point that I do think that Brett will be, you know, in the position to consider giving him legitimate minutes at, at some points throughout the season, which is something that I didn't necessarily expect during, uh, you know, like during summer league and whatnot. Uh, Michael Kasky Blomain is with us. Don't forget Sixers Celtics tomorrow night on 97.3 ESPN. The coverage starts at 8 o'clock. We haven't talked about Ben Simmons much, but uh, let's get into him. Uh, how much should we anticipate year-to-year development from him? I think we'll see a, a huge bump from Ben this year, Mike. I think that he, uh, you know, he's already said that he, you know, outside of the three-point shooting, he's not going to be coming out shooting threes. But I just think he, uh, you know, based off of what he did last year, I think he saw areas that he needed to address, specifically, you know, free throw shooting, some of his ability to pull up, um, you know, hit some of those elbow jumpers and shots within, you know, 10, 15 feet. I think he really, you know, got after it this off season. By all accounts, he, you know, his his physique looks great. He's in excellent shape. He looked, uh, you know, his shot looks improved, let's say, from, you know, 15 and in. The free throw shot looks a little bit better. So, I mean, we're talking about a guy that, you know, in his second year could really be, you know, a league leader in assists up there and rebounds for guards, points, near triple-double average. I think, uh, you know, as much as we, we're looking forward to the development of Joel after a full season of being healthy, I think Ben is a guy that has uh, – you know, that natural desire to just be great, um, you know, be – I think he knows he has the potential to be one of these guys that's a transcendent old generational talent. Mm-hmm. And I think he really worked on it over the summer, and I'm, you know, super excited to see what we see from him this year. So for all the people who were like, all right, is he going to expand his uh, range? Is he going to start shooting the threes? Uh, what's your message? 
I, you know, I just, I've said things similar to people on Twitter. I think Ben Simmons does so many things great, uh, you know, for his age with basketball to consistently dwell on the one area that he's not that great on. I think it's kind of a disservice just to him. And as a fan, it's just not as fun. I mean, this guy does so many things that are so advanced for his age. Like, yes, if he's going to be the best player ever, he's going to need to develop an outside shot. But he's so effective at doing the other things at this point in his game. I think it's something that could probably just come naturally. And this, let you know, it's not something that I think he needs to force. I think this year we'll see more willingness on his part to take shots, uh, you know, within the three-point range, in the paint, within the elbow. I think he'll be, uh, you know, more willing to go to the line and not be hesitant to draw fouls. I think it's all just a natural progression. But for the package that he brings for, you know, this age, I think it's, uh, you know, the Sixers are very lucky to have him, obviously. Uh, so we look at a couple of things here. I'm looking at the uh, the uh, Vegas win totals, and I see Philly at 53, but I see Boston and Toronto ahead of them. Are they the third best team in their own division? I think it's fair enough to say on paper going into the season that they are. I mean, obviously Boston is going to be the favorite after, you know, last season they beat us in the playoffs, adding Kyrie and Gordon Hayward. There's, I have no problem with Boston being the measuring stick in the East. Tor- Toronto is a little bit more of a wild card, obviously, with, uh, you know, the changes that uh, the head coach, the changes to, you know, swiping DeMar for Kawhi. Um, I think that'll be an interesting thing. I think that the Sixers could uh, definitely finish with a better record and be a better team than Toronto by the end of the season. It'll just be kind of interesting to see, you know, how that turns out. But on paper, I have no problem with the Sixers being, uh, you know, being ranked as the third best team in their own, in the Atlantic. But at the end of the day, I think there's a good chance that the Sixers and the Celtics will be the two teams that will be competing for the you know the Eastern title. So what is um, the expectation? What's a realistic goal for this year? I mean, we're now, all right, uh, what, uh, 19, 18, 10, 28, 52. Where are we now? Where Where is this whole Sixers? You know, it was a polarizing discussion for years. Where are we? I think they're at the point now, Mike, where you're looking at a perennial 50-win team that, you know, is just waiting to break through. Is this going to be the year that they get to the finals? I don't know. Uh, You know, I wouldn't be necessarily disappointed if they don't get to the finals this year. But I think that they're at that point where they've established themselves. You know, they have the young stars to build around. They won 52 last year. They certainly don't want to take a step back in terms of win total. So, I mean, they're at that at that point where they're, you know, a 50-win team, and it's just a matter of, you know, if and when they're able to take that final step from, a, a you know, a perennial 50-win team to that championship-caliber level team. I think, you know, the the rapid rate at which has happened is pretty, you know, pretty remarkable when you think you're talking about a team that won 10 games three years ago to now being a – you know, a 50-win team each year. But, um, you know, I think that's where they are. To me, success this season would be another, you know, a similar year to last year, maybe getting, a, you know, to the Eastern Conference Finals against the matchup with Boston, I think, would show some nice improvement or growth on the team. But with that being said, it's, it's all about the players. Um, you know, how far Joel can uh, take his game, how far Ben can take his game, and really what Markell turns out to be for this team will be, you know, as far as those guys can take the team is how far they'll go. Should be fun. Uh, it all starts tomorrow night. 97.3 ESPN's coverage begins at 8 o'clock. They're right back Thursday night at 8 against the uh, Chicago Bulls. And, uh, hey, you know, uh, it's. I, I guess a lot of people looking at this, and you know the expectations are going to be all wild for, depending on what side of the fence you've been on, but there's a lot of people that are saying, okay, now's the time. you got to get to the finals. And realistically, I, I, I don't know if you say this is a championship team, but – you just said a consistent 50 win team which is kind of where most people say they don't want to be it's all right to be a 50 win team but you don't want to be stuck there does this team have the look of a team that's going to get stuck there Nah, i I don't think so mike i I look at a team that has two young you know superstars in joel and ben and that's you know a 50 win team in the first year of competing when you have two building blocks like that to me is it's a trajectory going upwards at all like you know, I feel like you get stuck in that mediocrity when you don't have the pieces that can really, you know, kind of catapult you to that next level of success. I think the Sixers have, you know, at least two, maybe three in those, and they still have other assets. Um, you know, of course, the clock is ticking on some of these assets, but they still have cap space. They still have draft picks. There's still the ability to, you know, improve this team from the outside. So, you know, I have no fear that this team's going to kind of plateau, I think, 
they have, you know, all the pieces in place and they also have the, you know, the front office uh, directive to improve. It's not like at this point, treading water wouldn't be acceptable. They know they need to get better. So I think that all the pieces are in place for this team to get, you know, to become a, a legit championship contender. Obviously, things could happen in the meantime, but I think once you have the young talent on the roster, which is something that the team didn't have, you know, in the post-Iverson years for so long, they just didn't have those foundational pieces. We have them now, so I think it's, a, you know, obviously a matter of making sure that they live up to their potential, but I'm not worried about them getting stagnant. All right. Uh, for more coverage on the Sixers and the opener, go to 973 ESPN.com. They're going to be a little shorthanded tomorrow night. Uh, it looks like Chandler out. Muscala could be out for the game. Uh, and others, they finalized their roster. Michael has a piece about that right now at 973 ESPN.com. All right, pal. I'll see you Thursday. All right, Mike. Thank you.